With the amount of high quality content these streaming services are putting out, I feel that a good soundbar is a must have piece of tech for any home. So today we're going to be comparing three higher end at most capable soundbars. First we've got the Bose Smart Soundbar 900, we've also got the Sony HTA5000, and we've also got the Samsung HWQ800A. Now, when it comes to pricing, all of these soundbars are in the same wheelhouse. Now, both the Samsung Q800A and the Bose Smart Soundbar 900 retail for $900. However, I have noticed that Samsung likes to put the Q800A on sale on a regular basis for around $700 to $750. Whereas, ever since I got the 900, I haven't seen it go on sale once. And finally, there's the Sony HTA 5000, which retails for a cool $1,000. But also, just knowing Sony, I do expect this soundbar to go on sale on a regular basis as well. Now, for simplicity's sake, in this video, we're going to be strictly focusing on the soundbars themselves. Now, with all these soundbars, if you want, you can add external subwoofers and or surround sound speakers. And with both the Sony and Samsung, you can use them in tandem with a compatible Sony or Samsung TV. But that's a whole other story. Nonetheless, if you want to pick any of these soundbars up, they'll be linked down below. And if you want to further support the channel, check out the merch shelf down below. I made some shirts and hoodies that look and feel great. And if you've been watching me for a while, you know I can be very particular. So I'll only set my name on something that I'm really proud of. Now first, let's talk about the design of these soundbars. Both the Sony and Samsung soundbars do a great job of disappearing when you're watching a movie in a dark room, because both of these soundbars are using materials that do a great job of not reflecting any light. The Samsung has a non-reflective wire body, whereas the Sony is mostly speckled plastic. And this is good because soundbars are supposed to be heard, not seen. Whereas with the Bose, that's a different story. Now, I will have to admit the Bose is the most premium looking and most premium feeling soundbar here. We've got a metal grill on the front and we've got a glass top. However, this glass top does cause a major reflection and depending on your setup, this could be rather distracting. Now, I know this is a very minor detail, but I thought I'd point it out because every single time that I try to watch a movie with this soundbar, my eyes just naturally gravitate towards that glass top. Now, when it comes to dimensions, the Sony is an absolute unit. It has a length of 47 and 3 quarter inches, a thickness of 5 and a half inches, and a height of 2 and 3 quarter inches. I really feel that placing the soundbar can be a challenge for some people. But then there's the Bose, which has a length of 41.1 inches, a thickness of 4.2 inches, and a height of 2.3 inches. This soundbar is also pretty big, but much more manageable. And finally, there's the Samsung, which is the smallest soundbar here. The Q800A has a length of 38.6 inches, a height of 2.4 inches, and a thickness of 4.5 inches. Now, even though the soundbar is pretty small, so placing the soundbar is going to be much easier than these other two soundbars, you do gotta keep in mind that the Q800A has an external subwoofer that you have to worry about. Now, placing this external subwoofer isn't going to be too hard because it does connect to the soundbar wirelessly. However, this external subwoofer isn't for everyone. Now, unlike the Bose and Sony soundbars, which are fully self-contained soundbars, as in they don't need an external subwoofer, but you can always add one if you wanted to, the Q800A is dependent on this external subwoofer because without it, your audio is going to sound very flat. Now, some people will be excited that the Q800A comes included with an external subwoofer. And if you're trying to get out your living room or man cave, then by all means, the external subwoofer is great. However, some people will might prefer a fully self-contained soundbar. Maybe either they just don't have enough room for an external subwoofer, or they just don't want the type of overwhelming bass an external subwoofer provides in certain setup situations. Now, obviously, since the Q800A has that external subwoofer, it has the hardest hitting and deepest resonating bass here. 
But personally, I wouldn't recommend the Q800A if you're looking for a soundbar for your bedroom or if you live in an apartment with thin walls. Now, first off, if you're looking for a soundbar for your bedroom, you might just not have enough room for that external subwoofer. And personally, I just don't like the overwhelming base an external subwoofer provides when I'm watching something in my bedroom. I just want enough base to get the message across. And personally, I wouldn't recommend the Q800A if you live in an apartment with thin walls unless you don't mind being that neighbor. So overall, I would mainly recommend the Q800A or any other soundbar that has an external subwoofer, either for living rooms or man caves if you own a home. And overall, I did want to highlight the difference between a soundbar that is dependent on an external subwoofer versus a fully self-contained soundbar. But now let's talk about ports. Now both the Bose and Sony have an AC port on the back and thankfully there are no power bricks that you have to worry about hiding. Which is great because it just makes wiring the sound bars into your home theater setup a little easier and it also makes wall mounting the sound bars much easier as well. However, there are two things that I need to point out. Now, first off, both of these power cables are pretty short, so this could be a challenge for some people. And I also gotta point out that the Bose doesn't come included with a wall mounting kit. That's sold separately. Whereas with these other two sound bars, they come included. But then there's the Samsung, which has an external power brick that you have to worry about. And personally, I really don't like this. Having an external power brick just isn't as sleek and it's not like there wasn't enough room in the soundbar to have it built in. Now, continuing on the topic of ports, all of these soundbars have an HDMI out port that has support for both ARC and eARC. So as long as your TV also has eARC support, then you're going to be able to fully enjoy your uncompressed Dolby Atmos content or any other uncompressed audio format. But unfortunately, the Bose is the only soundbar here that doesn't have an HDMI import. Now, the Bose is definitely geared towards someone who is going to strictly stream their content from their TV. Whereas with both the Sony and Samsung soundbar, you can always plug in a Blu-ray player or a gaming console if you wanted to. However, these HDMI imports are pretty different. The HDMI import on the Samsung can do up to 4K 60Hz. Not bad, but personally I wouldn't plug in my gaming console because it could become a bottleneck. Whereas the HDMI import on the Sony can do 8K HDR and it can also do 4K 120Hz. Now 8K HDR is cool and all, but it's not super important right now because you need an 8K TV, 8K content, and a Blu-ray player that can spin out 8K, which isn't super common right now. But the fact that this HDMI import can do 4K 120Hz is great because it's less likely to become a bottleneck if you plug in your PlayStation 5 or Xbox Series X. But something the Bose has that these other two soundbars don't is an Ethernet port. But personally, I really don't think that's a big deal because all of these soundbars have Wi-Fi. Now, all of these soundbars have AirPlay 2 support, which is good if you're an iPhone user, and you can cast to all of these soundbars, which is good if you're an Android user. So as long as you're connected to the same Wi-Fi network as the soundbars, you can always stream music to it. And also with Wi-Fi, you can use either the Bose or Samsung soundbars as a smart speaker. Now, the Bose has support for both Alexa and Google Assistant, whereas Samsung Soundbar only has support for Alexa. And then there's a Sony Soundbar, which you can't use as a smart speaker. But again, I really don't think that's a big deal. But now let's talk about speaker setups. The Sony has three frontward firing speakers. There are two frontward firing subwoofers with exhaust ports that shoot out the sides of the soundbar. There are two beam tweeters which specifically try to bounce sound off of your walls. And there are two additional upward firing speakers which bounce sound off of the ceiling. Overall, this is a very solid setup. Then there's the Bose, which has a frontward firing tweeter. It is then flanked by four frontward firing woofers, two on each side. Then there are bass chambers, which have exhaust ports that shoot out the back. And finally, there are two upward firing woofers, one on each side. And finally, there's the Samsung, which has three frontward firing tweeters. There are two frontward firing speakers. There are two beam tweeters that shoot sound upwards. And like I mentioned earlier, there's that external subwoofer that handles the bass. 
But before we jump into the sound test, I feel that it's very important that we talk about max volume performance on these soundbars. Now, both the Bose and Sony are able to fill a large room with sound all by themselves. Whereas the Samsung Q800A, this soundbar is only able to fill a small or medium sized room with sound when used by itself. However, if you were to use the Q800A with a compatible Samsung Q Symphony TV, where the built in speakers on your TV are going to work in tandem with the soundbar itself, that's when the soundbar is able to fill a large room with sound. Now, if you have a compatible Sony Bravia TV, then you're going to be able to use your TV's built-in speakers in tandem with the Sony HTA5000, just like how you can with Samsung's TVs and soundbars. But unlike the Q800A, which is reliant on that Q-Symphony compatible TV to fill a large room with the sound, the A5000 is able to deliver all on its own. But with all that being said, we're going to jump into the sound test. Now, all of these soundbars are playing with their stock EQs. They're all playing by themselves, as in none of them are getting any help from the TV. And the Q800A is playing at max volume here, because if not, the soundbar wouldn't be able to keep up. Recharging shields. 
So like you may have just heard, obviously any sound bar is going to sound better than your TV's built-in speakers. Your TV most likely just has a pair of downward firing speakers that bounce sound off of the table, they don't get all that loud, and the bass becomes a rattling mess at higher volumes. Now you could have a more premium TV, like let's say the Samsung Q80A, whose built-in speakers do sound pretty good. But nonetheless, your movie watching experience is going to improve if you were to invest in a soundbar. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the Q800A doesn't get as loud as these other two soundbars when used by itself. When used by itself, the Samsung Q800A performs more similarly to the Bose Smart Soundbar 300. A capable soundbar, and I absolutely love recommending this soundbar, but this is a much less premium soundbar than the Q800A. However, if you were to use the Q800A with a Q-Symphony compatible TV, that's when the soundbar starts to perform just like as you'd expect. So we're going to jump into another quick little sound test, but this time around with the Samsung Q80A TV. So, with a little help from the Q80A, the Q800A is able to keep up with these other two soundbars. So, for that reason, I would mainly recommend the Q800A to someone who has a Samsung Q-Symphony compatible TV. If you have a TV from a different brand, or if your Samsung TV doesn't have Q-Symphony support, then for me, the Q800A is a bit of a tough sell. But nonetheless, when it comes to sound signatures, these soundbars do sound pretty different. Now, since the Q800A does have that external subwoofer, it has the hardest hitting and deepest resonating bass here. However, the soundbar itself does lean more towards a brighter sound signature, and sometimes it can sound a little narrow, but you've still got all of that bass in the background. Then there's the Sony. Now from a sound signature standpoint, the HTA 5000 does lean more towards a warmer sound signature, which is pretty much the case with all of Sony's speakers. So the HTA 5000 does put an emphasis on the bass and the mids and highs aren't as pronounced. So sometimes it can be a little hard to hear dialogue and sometimes this soundbar can sound a little shallow. However, where this soundbar really stands out is that it does have an above average amount of bass for a fully self-contained soundbar. Now, the A5000 isn't going to have as much bass as the external subwoofer on the Q800A, but the A5000 is going to have no problem rattling the walls in your house. And also, in the sound test, the A5000 was playing with its bass set to medium, so if you wanted to, you could kick it up a notch. And finally, there's the Bose, which I feel is the most balanced sounding soundbar here, and also feel that it has the best instrument separation here. And I also can't help but notice that it has the most noticeable sounding vertical channel here. Now, all these soundbars have a vertical channel, and these vertical channels are what gives 
gives you true Dolby Atmos support. Now what Dolby Atmos is, is that it's an audio format that allows creators to play sounds in a three-dimensional space. So for example, let's say there's a helicopter on the screen. If the creator chooses to, they can make it sound like that helicopter is above you. Whereas if you were to use a soundbar that doesn't have a vertical channel, then that helicopter is going to sound like it's coming at you or is going to sound like it's at the same level as you. Now, the A5000 also has a decent sounding vertical channel, but since the soundbar does lean more towards a warmer sound signature, its vertical channel isn't as pronounced as the vertical channel on the Bose. And then there's the Q800A who has the weakest vertical channel here. So I would definitely take that into consideration if you plan on placing the soundbar in a room with high ceilings. So overall, when it comes to sound, I feel the Bose is going to be able to please the most amount of people here. The Bose has a good amount of physicality in its base, so you're going to be able to feel what's going on on the screen. Its dialogue is also well pronounced, so it is very easy to hear what people are saying with this soundbar. And I also feel the soundbar has the best instrument separation and most noticeable vertical channel here, which helps with the overall immersiveness of this soundbar. But then there's the Sony, which does lean more towards a warmer sound signature. Now personally, I'm not the biggest fan of how this soundbar sounds, but if you're someone that's looking for a ton of bass from a self-contained soundbar, then the A5000 is a great choice. The A5000 has an above average amount of bass for a fully self-contained soundbar. But if you're trying to kit out a living room or man cave and you need a ton of bass, then you might want to go with the Samsung Q800A. Thanks to the included external subwoofer, this setup is going to give you way more bass than these other two soundbars. However, I truly feel that the Q800A is best when used with a compatible Samsung Q Symphony TV. Because without it, this soundbar is really going to leave you wanting more. You're going to have a ton of bass, but everything else is going to sound pretty quiet. But external subwoofer aside, the soundbar does lean more towards a brighter sound signature, even when used with Q-Symphony. So sometimes the soundbar can sound a little narrow. But where I would definitely look out for with this soundbar is the vertical channel. Out of all of these soundbars, the Q800A does have the weakest vertical channel here, so you're not going to get the best at most experience here, especially if you're going to use it by itself. But finally, let's talk about the apps and remotes on these soundboards. Now, personally, I feel that Sony has the worst remote and app here. The remote itself looks old and these buttons feel like complete mush. However, you can mess around with all of the settings on this soundbar directly from the remote itself, which is good because Sony's app isn't the best either. And personally, I actively avoid using this app because I constantly have connectivity issues with it. But then there's Samsung's app, which I also have connectivity issues with, so much so that I have to reinstall this app multiple times. However, if you can get this app to work, you have a good amount of customization options. You can adjust your EQ and you can also raise or lower the base of the subwoofer. However, if you decide to use Q-Symphony with this soundbar, you won't be able to customize your sound. You'll still be able to adjust the bass from your subwoofer, but you can't adjust your EQ. And for good measure, here's a look at the remote. It's much sleeker than Sony's remote. And finally, here's Bose's remote. It's pretty simple as well, but much sleeker than Sony's remote, and it feels much better as well. And you can also have some preset stations on your soundbar. However, where Bose really shines here is its app. I've had zero connectivity issues with this app, and from this app, you can adjust your EQ to your liking. Now, it's not as granular as Samsung's app, but you can adjust the center channel, the bass, treble, and vertical channel to your liking. So overall, I do have to say that Bose has the best app here, and it also has the most customization options here. But with all that being said, if you're trying to choose between any of these soundbars, it truly does boil down to your needs. Now, personally, I feel the Bose Smart Soundbar 900 is going to be able to please the most amount of people here. The soundbar has a good amount of physicality in its base, so you're going to be able to feel everything that's on the screen. The soundbar also has really good SMS separation and a very strong vertical channel, which helps with the overall immersiveness of this soundbar. The 900 is also able to fill a a large room with sound all on its own and it also has a very solid app. 
However, I really feel this soundboard is geared more towards someone who's just going to be streaming their content directly from their smart TV. I really wish that the Bose Smart Soundbar 900 would do away with the Ethernet port and instead get an HDMI import that could preferably do up to 4K 120Hz, but I think 4K 60Hz would be more likely. And personally, I really wish that top wasn't so reflective because it can be a little distracting. But then there's the Sony HTA 5000. If you're someone that's looking for a ton of bass from their soundbar, then the A5000 is a great pickup because this soundbar has an above average amount of bass and is going to have no problem shaking the walls in your house. It's also got that HDMI import which is great if you've got a Blu-ray player, a PlayStation 5, or an Xbox Series X because it can do 8K HDR but more importantly it can also do 4K 120Hz. But the main drawback of the A5000 is just its sheer size. This soundbar just isn't going to fit everywhere. There's also the nature of its warmer sound signature, so sometimes the soundbar can sound a little shallow. And then there's its app. I really feel Sony needs to work on their app for their speakers. And finally, there's the Samsung HWQ800A. This is a soundbar that I can only recommend that you pick up if you have a compatible Samsung Q Symphony TV. Because without it, this soundbar is going to leave you wanting more. And this soundbar also has the least impressive vertical channel here. However, if you do have a Samsung TV with Q-Symphony support, then the Q800A is a great pickup if you're trying to get out a living room or man cave. Thanks to the included external subwoofer, this is a great starting point for a home theater setup that is going to have no problem rattling the walls in your house. If you made it this far, I guess you enjoyed the video, so hit the like button and get subscribed. If you want to pick any of the products up, they'll be linked down below. And if you want to further support the channel, check out the merch. I made some shirts and hoodies that look and feel great. And you know, I can be very particular, so I'll only slap my name on something that I'm really proud of.